Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello, Pamela. And happy birthday, no. Thank you. <laughs> Look what you started now, Debbie. <laughs> I'm so sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. So, what I think what we should do, let's mute our cameras who are not presenting, just so we reduce our bandwidth a little bit, um, and hand over the floor to Debbie and Suzanne or Suzanne. I feel so bad. I'm always like not sure. <laughs> um, so, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Let's think about uh, Leonard Cohen, Suzanne. Then it's easy to Suzanne. remember. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, so we've got a fascinating session today about sharing our work. And I know many colleagues, including myself, sometimes you're not too sure when something is tech transfer, when is it, you know, should I share something um, openly or is this something that must be patented? So I'm hoping this session can clear up some of these answers that many of us have. Um, yeah, so Suzanne, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, so just, yeah, welcome and thank you for giving me and Debbie the opportunity to speak. I, um, we're very excited because we feel like there's lovely overlap actually between our two topics. I'm going to go straight off to my presentation. Um, so I, I normally do quite the opposite. I normally um, speak uh, to pictures a lot more than I speak to words, but um, given the topic, I felt that it was uh, necessary to just go into some definitions today. So what I hope to do is blitz through the definitions so we get some discussion time. So I hope that'll be okay with everybody. Um, so BD definitions, can everybody see my screen? Is it okay? I'm just seeing the block that our faces. Yeah, I can see. You can see. Okay, great. And you can see the entire screen, no? It, it wasn't me talking with you. I can see that. <laughs> it you wasn't you going well. very <laughs> normal. It sounded like you. <laughs> well, hello, welcome to, to more participants. <laughs> All right, so let's let's start with um, in in the South African context when we talk about IP. We kind of uh, refer to our Bible, which is the IPR Act, um, which was promulgated in 2008 and came into effect in 2010. And the reason this, this document is so central um, to the way we do tech transfer in South Africa is it was aimed at public benefit. And what do we mean by public benefit? We mean at actually literally improving the quality of the life of South Africans. Um, and you might ask, how does a piece of legislation that is about IP do that? So let's uh, take that journey first off. Um, so let's just start with what is IP? Um, IP is intangible, so it's difficult to get your mind around sometimes. But the way I like to think of it is it's something that you can come up with as an idea, whether that's an academic idea or just a eureka moment, um, but it's something that can be translated into something that is real. Um, so whether that's a product or a service, um, a cure to HIV, a vaccine, uh, which we'd all love somebody to, to develop a, a COVID vaccine really quickly right now. Um, anything that can become a tangible something that you could trade with, that you can exploit commercially. Um, and then we talk about the IP creator, so this is quite interesting because the Act in South Africa does actually talk about IP enablers as well as IP creators. What's the difference? The IP would not be possible. It would not exist without the creator, but the enabler could add something to it that adds value to the specific IP. Um, in tech transfer, we talk a lot about inventions. Um, and I know that sounds a little bit mad scientist like, but when we talk about inventions, we're talking about something that um, is that tangible thing and you can protect it. So when we talk about protection, we talk about uh, everything from trade secrets, trademarks, copyright, and the one that most people know, patents. Um, so 
your plant breeders rights designs are also one that I didn't mention there are also inventions business concepts are inventions um, and I think I mentioned trademarks trade secrets and know-how um, I'm going to answer any questions on what are those a little bit later I just want to get through the full narrative <laughs> first so do uh, hold your questions on those till question time um, so then in the academic sphere we talk about disclosures um, and a disclosure is when let's say Nikki has um, an idea for a new bionic arm as you can see in this picture and there's all kinds of biosensors and really cool things that she's come up with to put in this bio arm and she comes to the tech transfer office and she discloses it um, so she's basically telling us the technical information about what this invention is a disclosure can also be a public disclosure and we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well because public disclosures can be a little bit complicated for us in tech transfer an actionable disclosure means that the invention that you've now put out there and its technical information can actually be registered under IP rights. So that takes it to that place where it's now just something that you've spoken about to something that you can protect with a patent or any of the other um, registrable IP forms that I've mentioned. So what is a patent? A patent gives the patent owner, and that could be either an individual or an individuals, a group, uh, a company or an institution like a university, this exclusive right to commercially exploit your invention. And those rights last for 20 years. Um, and they're two very important and sometimes confusing criteria for us to be able to patent something. And those two criteria are, it has to be novel or new. So they compare it, when I say they, I'm talking about IP attorneys. When they file a patent, they go and look at all the prior art. What is prior art? It's all the other existing um, inventions out there and their patents and registrable IP or registered IP that exists already. And they go and look whether your technology has something added to that. So is it new? And it has to be non-obvious, which I always love. It's fascinating. Basically, this means you can't or you're not supposed to be able to easily reverse engineer the idea. And it has to have what they call an inventive step. And that inventive step, if you think about it, is really the thing that makes it new. So. It all sounds a little bit pie in the sky, but stick with me and um, we'll take you forward through this journey and then we'll see if you following. Okay, so now let's talk very briefly. I'm not going to go into this uh, too much, but this is a kind of a summary of, uh, this is a very standard process of tech transfer in universities across the, the globe. Um, there's, there's really very little that, that differs from university to university in this kind of cycle. Um, so as you can see, it starts with research, we hope, and then we hope that the research uh, group or the academic comes to the tech transfer office and discloses the invention. And then we evaluate it and see if it is something that we can protect and whether we want to commercially exploit this idea, this invention. And then there's this very definite step of now you're going to register the IP. So that's either the patent or the registered design or the like. But that changes something. And the reason that changes something, this is obviously before it goes off and becomes a technology development project and then you start taking it towards market. You start uh, making it a, commercial, a commercializable entity. Um, but there's this cutoff here, right? When, as soon as you protect. Um, and the reason for us is, as I said, the, the patent has to have a criterion of novelty. Um, and earlier I, I, I just alluded to a public disclosure. We get into a really difficult space if we have a public disclosure before the IP is registered, before it's protected. 
Um, and the reason being is then it's no longer novel. So we talk about destroying novelty. After you've protected it, now you can disclose it in any kind of public forum. So whether that's a publication, conferences, um, other research groups that you want to discuss it with, or the public at large. Um, as we know that uh, some controversial papers become front page news, which obviously scientists are quite happy about because that highlights the importance of science. But uh, for us in, in tech transfer, this is a, a tricky balance sometimes. There are times where we'll get to that pr preliminary evaluation and we'll definitely decide that this is just not a commercial um, prop, uh, proposition. It's not a strong marketable proposition, in which case then it's great. You can go ahead with your publication and so on. Where we're really stuck up a tree is where <sighs> You have an excellent invention, but we can no longer protect it by patent. And that makes our, our, our journey towards commercialization very difficult. Um, there's a lot of confusion in this area because, for example, a lot of people will tell you, but just make it public knowledge and then it's for the good of everybody. Um, and I wish that was true, but as we know that if uh, let's just say some poor country somewhere in Africa, let's take, I don't know, Angola, were to come up with an excellent vaccine candidate for uh, COVID-19 tomorrow, and they wanted to market this to the whole world. And they decide, well, you know, obviously everybody needs it. So we're just going to put the formula for the vaccine out there and we're just going to let the world go ahead and do with it what they will. Unfortunately, some greedy pharmaceutical company will come along, make sure that they get they are the first to market and dominate and sell that vaccine at probably a very high price. So free public access is not necessarily the same as public good. Um, and this is what's sort of essential to understand about this slide. Um, so then I also just wanted to show you this is actually a typical economic curve. So um, I did, did my homework and as you can see, the copyright is acknowledged at the bottom of the screen. Um, the, this just illustrates that as you get closer to market, as you develop your technology further and further, you start reducing the risk of the failure of the technology. Because if you, obviously every time you do a new iteration, you modify it, you improve the technology, and you're putting more into it. And of course, the cost of the, the technology is um, boosted, but also enriches the technology because of the skill and the capacity within a university. That kind of academic in integrity is very different from a, a private R&D perspective, which rushes to market. Universities will really spend time on developing their technologies and their inventions because we take a research and a scientific approach to these things. So you end up with a mature technology that's been de-risked. And when I say de-risked, I mean that you've basically tested all your assumptions about this technology. Um, is there a market? How big is the market? What's the price point? All of those things. And you've also protected this technology with the um, registrable IP forms that we've already done discussed. So let's say you put a patent on it. Um, and now it's mature, it's ready for market. So you can see how a university technology can really offer something very potent to industry to trade. So why does the sharing of information thing become very important? Um, on the right hand side, you'll see a, um, a little infographic that we developed together um, with NIPMO and with an amazing uh, graphic designer, if anybody wants to get in touch with her. Um, there are three IP ownership positions that are allowed by our legislation. Either it's publicly funded, in which case it belongs to the university altogether or there is somebody that comes along as a collaborator, which puts both time and money and actual IP creation into the process. Um, and then you have the position of co-ownership. 
and you know the percentage depends on a kind of pro rata um, so it depends on how much is put in um, and then finally the full cost position which is when a funder or a collaborator would have to put in direct and indirect costs to develop the technology. What do I mean by indirect costs? I always joke that it includes the toilet paper, but it does. It's about the um, electricity, the infrastructure, the uh, consulting services of your academics and support staff. It's really absolutely any cost linked to developing that technology. So what are we saying here? We're saying that because the IP most often by default belongs to the university, you have quite an obligation to think twice before you um, publish or share it at conference presentations or with anybody else, those public disclosures, just to, to think twice about it. Um, because not only are you talking about university owned technology, but there's a real compromise if we, we have a destruction of novelty. Um, and that comes in here. So we've uh, heard in the IDP and um, from a lot of the work that com communications and advancement's been doing at the university, that third stream income generation is definitely something that the university is focusing on. From a tech transfer point of view, there are three main ways in which we can generate a third stream income. And that is either by IP assignment, which is our least favorite. Um, it's when you outright sell your registered IP. So it's when you sell a patent or a design. Um, it's a once or fee. And the reason we're not mad about it is we lose a lot of control as to what can be done with that IP. Um, the second way is a license, which is a agreement that you enter into with a commercial partner and the commercial partner will sell the product or service and royalties come back to the university. And the third one, which we're very excited, we're hopefully going to do this soon at Rhodes, is spin out companies. This is when you form a new company with the technology coming from the university. Um, just a few things here. Uh, with your royalties, once or fees, and dividends, your IP creators are also um, receivers of that, of that benefit. So it's not just the university. Um, your IP creators are actually incentivized by the law. Um, they will uh, get at least 20% of that, that income. Um, and that goes to them directly, uh, whether they want to buy a boat with it or put it towards the RA, that is income that goes directly to the IP creators. The second thing about that is these um, other forms of income, these third stream income can definitely support activities at the university, um, whether the university has quite a lot of play to decide whether you want to put that towards more research, bursaries, um, and of course the actual on ongoing sustainability of tech transfer at the university. Right, so why is this important at all? Well, remember that public benefit thing we spoke about right at the beginning? This is where it becomes real. So when we do these things, we can increase economic activity and the opportunity to partake in academic, economic activity. So job creation, we can contribute to growing the tax base. We can also make additional um, income for our university. And all of this together is a very important factor of what our government has identified as a plan for rapid economic growth. So this is the clincher because we're saying, okay, IP belongs to the university for a very real reason because they become custodians of this process where the public good is done in a specific way to contribute to our economy and to our university's well-being. So I hope that whole journey now starts making sense because this is why we're saying, okay, we need to be a little bit careful about when and how we share information beyond the university. So 
Um, Debbie's going to take over from me from, from copyright onwards, um, but there's just a few things I want to say about copyright before we go into some question time. Um, so firstly, I always see copyright as a bit of a problem child in South Africa. Um, you might all be very aware of the amendment bill, which has been very problematic. And the latest uh, development there is that it has actually been sent back to the portfolio committee to um, edit and, and hopefully extensively edit uh, the amendment bill. Um, the uncomplicated part of copyright. What, what is going on with copyright? Basically, it's the same as a patent, but for written works. It gives the author the right to exploit their own work. And it applies to any kind of written work. Um, so books, texts, articles, the whole works, data. Um, and the author, the author is the person that wrote it. Your two important things you have to remember is copyright only applies to original work and copyright is automatic in most cases. Um, if it's a screen, screen work, the author has to register it with SIPC. But for the rest, if I've written down a sentence and it's original, I already own the copyright to that work. Um, I do not have to run off to IP attorneys or SIPC or anybody to register that specific IP. So um, Rhodes has some, I think, very nice um, principles when it comes to the uh, IP policy. Um, and so I've continued calling the slide uncomplicated copyright. Um, authors, meaning students and staff, automatically own their own copyright. Um, and Rhodes does not lay claim to their IP rights. Uh, the copyrights of students' thesis, etc., also belongs to them, um, except where Rhodes would like a non-exclusive royalty-free license to publish. So in other words, we actually publish all our, our students' theses, um, and that is under the condition of a non-exclusive royalty-free license. Um, also uncomplicated, it's a nice, easy way to just remember to always reference your work, um, put your little copyright C and the year and Rhodes University and your name and you have officially um, put a stamp of copyright on your work, which is an, uh, uh, an added level to, to protect yourself. Um, the year or the date is very important because we spoke about originality. If I write a sentence today and I write the same sentence tomorrow, then obviously tomorrow's sentence is not original. So the date is very important in order to authenticate that you are the original author. Um, this is where it gets complicated again. This is also an excerpt from the IPP, the University Intellectual Property Policy. Um, staff members own their own uh, course material unless they were um, supported or paid by an outside contractor to create that work. So that's in a sense almost like a consulting job or a contract or piece of work. Um, also staff are not allowed to produce their own course content and then sell it to their students if it's prescribed material. Um, and then finally, and this is an important point to understand. So if most copyright does not actually, um, is not covered or is not uh, something that pertains to the IPR Act, but if that copyright is in a place where it could be commercialized, then that changes. So for example, if I write a massive database that I could sell to someone, or I write programming for an AI entity, then that copyright now has a commercially exploitable angle. And because our law says that if we have IP that can be exploited for South African benefit, now we're obliged to do that. So um, this is the, the, the final and important, and I'll, I'll speak about this more in question time if, if you have any questions on computers and programming and software aspects of, of IP protection. But um, we do have to be very careful 
of just putting um, these kinds of information on um, open serve or, or public platforms, because then again, we run into that problem of it's now public knowledge. Um, and that, uh, that takes away our control in terms of how we'd like to exploit the IP. So, oops, I went the wrong way. Still going the wrong way. Sorry, everybody. Um, that's my last slide. Um, that this is myself and my two colleagues who are in the chat with us, uh, Pamela and Nandi. Um, if you have any questions, you are super welcome to email us. If you'd like us to come and present your research groups, you are super welcome to email us. Uh, let's jump straight into, I'm going to try my best to keep to my 10 minutes of uh, uh, question time and then Debbie can continue with her presentation. Does anybody have anything they want to throw my way? Nothing happening that I bore everybody. John, I've got a question, if I may. It's Absolutely. So how do you balance out then within the research office the publication of journal papers, conference papers, and the like, versus where there might be some sort of intellectual property implication of that? And I imagine it happens more in sciences than elsewhere, but I just wondered, does your office interface with staff who want to go to conferences or publish an article, or how does that work? Thanks for that question, Noel. It's a very important one. So we've been trying to sort of bang out a um, process, um, and, it, and it is very difficult because as you know, um, publications or the intent to publish doesn't necessarily go through the research office um, first thing either, right? It's, it's more the publication count. So it's after the fact. Um, so what we, sorry, Noel, were you about to add something to the question? No, no, sorry. No, no. Um, so what we, what we try to do is we have attempted to work very closely to um, both the NRF office, um, because obviously they're highlighted towards projects that may um, create IP. And I review the IP sections on all the agreements that go through the research office. Um, so it's, it's a nice way for me to screen um, the projects that are going around. But our main um, way of getting this information across is, is information sessions like this uh, to let academics know just how we go about this process. And, and it is slow, obviously, um, and it's difficult to get that awareness completely penetrated throughout the university. Um, just one thing to add there, we, we definitely, obviously you do see more patentable inventions coming from the sciences but we are not biased towards the sciences. There are amazing innovations coming out of um, what we call the SSHA innovations, uh, social sciences and humanities, humanities and arts, SSHA. Um, and we're definitely trying to give a focus towards that. Um, there's also lovely collaborations between your SSHA and scientific um, innovations coming out of universities in Europe. And we'd certainly like to emulate that. Uh, I hope I've answered that question, Noel. Yes, thanks, Susan. Pleasure. Anything else? Nothing. Everybody's quiet. Nicola, I either bored everybody or threw too much information at them, in which case I really apologize, guys. No, I think it actually will make more sense when we contrast the two the tech transfer yeah. and the, then, you know, I guess they will have probably a richer discussion because um, I think that's where it gets confusing. Perfect. Now then I think Debbie should take center stage and, and I'll be here to answer any questions at the end if, if there are any. Cool. Thanks, Suzanne. And over Thanks. to you, Debbie.
Thank you. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie Martindale. I'm just trying to share my screen with you. Um, I'm hoping that I'm getting onto my slide slides. Are you able to see the slides? Yes, we can see them. Perfect. Okay. I hope you don't mind if I keep the, um, the video off. Um, I'm experiencing a little bit of a lag here, and so I, I started worrying about the presentation this afternoon. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Go for it. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, I have a few slides to go through in there. Um, I'm going to speak to each of the slides, but I just want to say, say from the outset, this is a, an RU teaching online uh, forum, but I do think that the work that I do in scholarly communications uh, overlaps this, this area in many respects, especially when we've had workshops or face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with um, postgrad stu students and staff. Um, often the, the remark I get or, or the feedback that I get is, um, we wish we'd known about this a little bit sooner. So maybe this is one of those times where we can say, this is a little, um, one of the times that we can say that this is now sooner. I also like to start um, a discussion like this just to define scholarly communication because it, it shows very clearly how informal channels um, support the traditional research um, practice and models. So this definition where scholarly communication is defined as the system through which research and other scholarly writings are created, evaluated for quality, disseminated to the scholarly community, and preserved for future use. The system includes both formal means of communication, such as publication and peer reviewed journals, something that we're all familiar with, and the more informal channels. And it's the informal channels that creates this um, unease in, in researchers um, as to how this can really support the traditional peer reviewed journal models. So, Open access is largely um, the basis of, of my role at, in the library and at, in the university. And I like this, this definition by Peter Suba for uh, um, open access. It is an idealistic one, but it's a really good fundamental basis of what everybody is striving for. And that we're looking for open access literature, which is digital, online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. Open access removes price barriers, which is subscriptions, licensing fees, pay-per-view fees, and permission barriers, which is uh, most copyright and licensing restrictions. And as Suzanne said earlier, there's this overlap between what happens in the tech transfer office and the library and the research office um, in the registrar's division as well. There are um, a lot of uh, two major principal routes of open access. The, the, there are others other than the green and the, and the gold route, but I'm only going to speak about the green and the gold, gold route now. So what is green route open access? It's all about self-archiving and the practice of depositing articles in an institutional repository or a central repository or a subject repository. And I can see very clearly that Roach researchers have taken this on board. Um, you can see research and articles on research data published in, in, in one form or another in these different repositories. But at the bottom of the screen, what I would like to, to point out is the Creative Commons. So where Suzanne spoke about copyright and licensing and the IP um, activities that happen in the um, tech transfer office, a lot of the work that comes my way has to do with Creative Commons, and I'll speak to this a little bit more and throughout, throughout the presentation. And this little icon here will tell you if something it has um, a Creative Commons copyright license, and that is an open access article. And this little icon that, that you can, I'm hoping that you can see my, my arrow, sh shows um, the different licensing options that you can have when you create a um, Creative Copy license um, for yourself. So copyright and creative commons. The link there uh, on the screen shows you um, how you can choose a license for yourself. You will be sh given this opportunity to choose a license. You go through the, these uh, flows of choose the features, 
optional information, and then you finally get the license. But basically what you're looking for is, is which license suits you the best for your article or for your research data. And this little infographic that you can also uh, see when you, when you get onto this web page helps you decide which of the licenses that uh, most suit you. But there's a lot, there's a lot, of, a lot of information there, and there isn't time now to talk about it. But uh, your librarians, the tech transfer office, and the research office can help you just decide which license is best suited for you. I'd like to talk a little bit about our institutional repository. This is an investment made by Rhodes University through the SEALS Consortium. And the SEALS Consortium is a consortium um, with libraries from Walter Sisulu, University of Fort Hare, Nelson Mandela University and Rhodes. So through that consortium, um, we, the university invested in VITAL, which is the platform of our institutional repository, and we call it the Rhodes Digital Commons. There is a link there to the Digital Commons, so if, you, if you're not familiar with it or you just want easy access to it, please um, take a look at our, our um, comments and see why it could be important for you. But essentially, institutional repositories are digital collections of the outputs created within a university or research institution. It is fully copyright compliant, and how we do how we assess that is through the open access button. We also use the unpay wall um, extension, Copernia, which is a web of science extension. Those three, by the way, are uh, Chrome extensions that you can install on, on your PC or laptop. We also go through Sherpa Romeo uh, for copyright compliancy, and we also look to see if the article or research data has a Creative Commons license. Basically, everything that is uh, uploaded onto our institutional repository is copyright compliant, and it could either be um, a fu full text version or PDF of the article, it could be a preprint copy, or it could be a citation link to the publisher's platform, but it is all copyright compliant. Um, when researchers are granted funding, Sometimes, and more often than not, researchers are asked to publish their research into um, an open access repository, and it is advocated that, that you support um, the institutional repository. Types of articles that can, uh, types of works that can be deposited into the, the, the digital commons. Automatically, the theses and dissertations uh, are sent to the library and we are cataloging staff um, upload those into to the Commons. We're busy working on the article and conference papers. You can see that we, there are reports. These are technical reports or uh, reports generated from research groups, research data. This, this next icon here is research data. And you can also see audio and visual um, works can be added onto the repository and of course books and book chapters. I've been working a lot with the research output uh, for 2019, 2020. Some of it's even gone into 2021. But already you can see the hits and the interest and the uptake and downloads of the research articles that are already on the repository. So it, I strongly encourage you to make use of, of me and I can help you upload these articles into the repository. Okay, so now we've spoken a lot about the green route of, of open access. I just want to touch on, on the gold route of open access. This definition um, on the screen is, a, is again one of the ideals that we, we are striving for um, in that we can use open access journals to make content immediately available to the public free of charge and in line with open access requirements at the time of initial publication. What you're not seeing here um, unfortunately is, is the factor that, that is a huge challenge for publishing in open access journals and that's the article processing char charges or costs, the APCs. It is up to the author to, to pay these APCs to have the article published in open access journal. And sometimes these range from $500 to $1,000 and more, and that's a lot of money. Uh, currently, researchers are finding their way around that um, to make the article an open access publication 
by using some of the research grants or also applying to the research office uh, as part of the, the, the APC budget. It is a very limited budget, so um, not many articles are able to be published open access in this way. Having said that, um, we still encourage and, and advocate publishing in, in open, um, open access journals. A lot of our researchers are publishing in the Public Library of Science, or PLOS, um, so uh, if you're interested, take a look at that. Um, and for humanities and social, sciences, uh, social science uh, research articles, the directory of open access journals um, has, a, has an extensive list of open access uh, journals that you can choose uh, in, in your field. I have inserted a list um, of list of accredited journals on the slide, and it takes you to our subject guide, or you can see that it says LibGuide, but it's a subject guide um, which will also help you decide if this, if this open access journal is an accredited journal um, and therefore permissible to be published in at Rhodes University. There's also some information there about predatory journals. Um, what I do think is important is that the open access is a, uh, is a movement, a movement suggests change, and the publishers themselves are changing their business models. So for instance, you've got Elsevier, you've got Wiley Open Access, you've got um, Sage, Springer, and Taylor and Francis. All of them offer um, researchers to publish their articles in the traditional way. In other words, they don't have to pay the um, APC, or researchers are invited to also publish um, the same um, article in the journals, but by uh, open access means, and then you have to pay the APCs. But it is important to note that the, there is a, a huge change happening here. And even now with the, with the pandemic and the COVID-19, a huge change came about where suddenly all these journals who, who, who are fighting against um, the open access movement um, to some degree, suddenly opened up all the channels to open um, resources for research um, being conducted uh, on, uh, on the COVID-19. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, re about research data management, and this is now specifically research data. Whether um, inf um, institutional repository speaks to um, research articles and audiovisual material, research data management is about research data. And, and what do you do with the data that you have generated uh, in your research project projects? And in many instances, researchers at the start of the research uh, project have been generating some form of data, even if it's decision making. What am I going to do with my data? What kind of data am I going to have? Is it qualitative? Is it action? Is it um, quantitative? And this is all a form of data management planning. So we have a lot of uh, queries coming uh, to us at the library about research data management and um, data management plans. And there's a link here to our, our subject guide uh, about RDM and data management plans. I'd also like to, to um, showcase a uh, fig share. So whereas the university invested in our institutional repository vital, they've also invested in um, the purchase of FigShare as our platform for research data management. And both Vital and FigShare are hosted and managed uh, by library staff. This is where you would uh, submit your, your FigShare, uh, sorry, your research data to the FigShare platform. Oh, this is a little bit slow in moving forward. I'm going to try again. Okay. Sorry, something's happened here. Sorry, this isn't what I'm supposed to be showing. Here we go, go back again. This is a very, very busy slide, but it gives you an idea of the kind of research uh, data that can be added to Figshare. And it's very simple. You get onto the uh, Figshare um, platform and, you, and it's both the institution repository and the Figshare uh, platform you'll find under Quick Links 2 on the Rhodes uh, Library page. You would log in your, your details as, as you would in, in, when you log in your emails, 
and you are directed through uh, the process of how you would upload your, your text or your Excel sheets or your images, any of these um, formats and, and physical and digital objects um, are able to be loaded onto our Figshare platform. Okay, so I've spoken a lot about Figshare and there's a link here to our, our subject guide. You may already be familiar with other research data management platforms like Dropbox, OneDrive, which is um, also Rhodes University supported. So Noda, a lot of scientists use that. GitHub for um, scientists and computer science. And also Google datasets. And I, I put in Google datasets because it's a if you type in um, Rhodes University researchers, a lot, of, a lot of our researchers are using Google datasets. So moving on a little bit, um, and the reason I've put in this slide is because it may be a very useful slide. Um, so I'm not going to uh, speak about it a lot other than point you to the LibGuide um, link here because it helps you um, with your thought processes about online research identity and ORCID, research collaboration and social scholarship, researcher visibility, impact and citation analysis, research tools and public, uh, pl plugins, and then research data management and data management plans. And I think it's we, we put a lot of effort uh, into keeping this, this um, web, website updated. So uh, it could provide use for, hopefully provides use for information for your, your purposes and decision, decision making. Okay, online research identity. Without going into too much detail, we know that um, a lot of researchers already have researcher IDs on platforms like Google Scholar Citations, Researcher ID and Publons, Scopus Author ID, which is a Elsevier platform. Then there are also uh, um, researcher IDs with platforms such as Loop. This is a, a scientific one. What, what I'm saying here is that a lot of researchers may already have a lot of researcher IDs and it can become very overwhelming. And this is where ORCID plays a very, very important role. And so I'm going to speak a little bit about ORCID in, in this um, context. So ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor ID. Um, for more information about ORCID, you can, uh, to go, you can go to the ORCID website. Um, to register, I don't want to do that. I don't know why I clicked on that. To register your ORCID, you go to um, this register your ORCID ID and you are asked just to submit your name and your surname, your email address. And once you've met, you've submitted, you're um, sent an email and ask you to verify your ORCID. Once you've done that, you will be allocated an ORCID, which is an, a persistent researcher identifier. And the reason why ORCID was created in 2003 was because they real, there was a realization that publishers were publishing articles under either their maiden or married names, as in the situation of Helen Cruz, where she's published articles under both her names. And then also other publishers would, would se uh, other authors would send their works to publishers um, using their preferred publish publication name, but the publishers themselves uh, published the articles using a version of the name um, of, of the author's name according to their own regulations. So researchers were accumulating these huge variety um, variations of their name. And what ORCID does is use a social media technology to bring all research works published under all the different variations of name and bring it under one link um, and attach it to your persistent identifier. And I know I've spent a bit of time explaining this, but I think it's quite critical because when researchers uh, apply for academic funding or academic rating, and uh, they have done so without using the ORCID, the funders and the raters will evaluate the research output only on the name that um, you have given in your application. But if you have given your ORCID, which is now compulsory, um, the funders and the raters are able to evaluate your entire research output and make a, a more substantial evaluation of your research output and your, your application. Okay, this is a very quick slide to show you that what one can do with, a, with an ORCID profile. You can create an, um, uh, an online CV where you have a biography and education employment. You can, these are the different variations of your names under also known as. 
by, promote, by selecting country um, South Africa, you're promoting South African and African research. And just under websites, you can link your, your other researcher IDs, such as academia.edu, LinkedIn, Mendeley, and ResearchGate, and all the others. And then more importantly, well, not more importantly, but importantly, um, there's an, uh, there is a, a facet here where you can upload all your works into your, your ORCID profile. And in all of your, your, your uploads, there will be a link to your work on the publisher's platform. Okay, um, the last bit on ORCID. As a researcher, you would submit your research, your, your research article to the publisher with your ORCID um, ad number attached. Once the publisher publishes and accepts and publishes your article, automatically that information is sent through to the employer, Rhodes University, and to the funder. And really essentially what that means is that you enter your, your um, information once and you submit your article once, and it's reused often and circulated so that everybody in the whole process, ORCID process gets to know about your research article. Um, and it really works, and it, I can tell you it helps me a lot in my job when I upload articles onto um, Vital or Research Data, uh, sorry, the Rhodes Digital Commons. A quick way of sharing your ORCID is by putting it in your um, email signature because other people will see um, your email content, realize that you have an ORCID profile and go into your profile. And this is one way that um, research collaborations are expanded. Getting, getting to the end now. <laughs> Um, this is the slide where, again, I've given a link to research collaboration and social scholarships. Um, the reason for the slide is to give you an idea of the different platforms you might be wanting to engage with. You may already be familiar with ResearchGate and Academia.edu, but there are other ones called Amico, Viva, I've mentioned Loop already, and Mendeley. And Mendeley, although is a, um, a software, reference software management tool, it is also used for social scholarship and re research collaborations. Um, this slide um, talks about research visibility, impact, and citation analysis. We have already spoken about ORCID in great detail. I have already um, spoken a little bit about Google Scholar citations. Researcher ID and Publons, uh, we can have a whole session just on that um, because there's been some amazing moves with uh, Web of Science. Um, Scopus, where you have your author, Scopus author ID. But what I also want to touch on is the more informal aspects of citation analysis, and that is altmetrics. Um, so you may have seen already on, on articles, published articles, a little icon that looks like this, which is altmetrics, or one that looks like this, which is plum analytics. And what does that mean to us? Okay, this article was published on the 7th of May in 2020, so just a, a recent article. Um, it is an, uh, an article published one of our researchers um, in the physics department. Uh, let me just go back. You'll see here it, is, it has an altmetric value. You can also look at um, other, other um, metrics, but we're going to look at the altmetric value. And what does that value mean? Well, this screenshot that I've just uh, um, pulled up now was taken on the 21st of July. So the article was published on the, uh, in May. And by the 21st of July, this article was already shared informally um, in 10 news outlets uh, via two blogs and had, was tweeted by four other people. Um, so already there was a social media uptake and sharing of this article. Um, you can also drill down a little bit further and see where the interest has come um, for this article. And you can see it's largely come from uh, North America and Turkey. And that's the value of altmetrics. It gives you an opportunity to see how valuable um, the, uh, your, the research article is. And it's looking at the article level of a uh, metric of the article, which is why it's called altmetrics. Um, very often, um, the metrics is focused on, on the science, scientific research output. And this is a, an excellent article, which um, if you're in the humanities and social sciences, um, domain, I think you'll find this very interesting and very encouraging to see the move of, of altmetrics in the humanities um, arena. Rhodes University, this is a bit of a plug for Rhodes University, we have um, a Facebook page and we have a Twitter page. 
um, we will encourage you to follow us. But what I also would like to mention that is that since 2017, uh, 2013, um, the Rhodes faculty librarians um, share research output uh, that's generated every month via our um, tweets and also on, on the Facebook platforms. Quickly, um, you may already know about RefWorks um, as, a, as a research um, reference management tool. Rhodes Library uh, subscribes to RefWorks. Rhodes University subscribes to Paper Pile. Um, we do not subscribe to EndNote, but it is available to you um, at no cost via the Web of Science platform. Um, some researchers have actually purchased their own subscription for that. And then, of course, we also support Mendeley and Zotero. There are a number of um, reference management tools. And if you want to see the others, you can go to our look guides. A link is there for you to see. And then lastly, I just want to speak about um, Copernia and Unpaywall and Open Access Button. These are Chrome extensions and you um, have to install them onto your, to your laptop or PC. But what it does do is that when you call up uh, or when you research um, for articles and um, you come across a paywall, meaning that uh, we're not, we, Rhodes University does not subscribe to that article, um, Copernia finds other ways that perhaps this article could be made available to you legally um, by an open access means. And um, again, in my job, these three tools are very invaluable um, to, to source open access articles. Um, and I, th I think that's a, it's, a, it's well worth having a look at. And for more information, you can go to our loop guide and the link is there for, for you. And I'm glad to see that uh, Suzanne spoke a lot about uh, copyright and plagiarism, but here I'd just like to, to mention that um, we have an undergraduate librarian who has um, created a, a fantastic information commons uh, subject guide. And one of the, the subjects or one of the tabs that she has on that guide is all about referencing and plagiarism. And uh, this might be something useful that you might want to refer students and postgrad students um, to um, in, in this, uh, copyright and plagiarism, a ch challenging situation that we often are, are faced with. For more assistance in, in everything that I've spoken about, the, um, I have the names of our faculty principal librarians. Uh, for science and pharmacy, it's Ms. Tandewe Menzi. Commerce and law, Ms. Joel Otto. And humanities and education, Ms. Linda Cartwright. And then, of course, um, you can also contact me. Uh, I'm Debbie um, Scholarly Communications, and my details are there. And thank you very much. Um, uh, are there any questions for us? Um, yes, Debbie, there's one from Noel. Uh, do add-ons only work on Chrome? Is the question. Um, yes, w well, there are Chrome extensions. I, th um, I haven't played around on Firefox. I, I don't know if you using would be using Firefox. So what I could do is, um, I, I could play around. It would be quite fun to play around and see. And I can get back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Debbie. Okay, any more questions? Maybe you want to type in the chat or take the mic. Um, I've got a question for you, Debbie, which yes. is around teaching materials. So at the moment with remote teaching, many lecturers are creating, you know, or narrated presentations and materials that could potentially be licensed openly and shared, you know, would they then share that on Figshare? Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. A really good question, and thank you for that, Nicola. Um, Figshare. We already have open education resources on Figshare, uh, um, and since I spoke about Figshare to, to um, another group on the CPGS group, uh, I can see that we've been inundated with Fig, with Figshare uh, um, deposits. Um, and these online video. This is the ideal platform for those for the online video tool. We have been asked by our, our library director to convert our online tutorials and, and, and so on um, into videos or uh, um, PowerPoint presentations and to load them onto Figshare as well. Um, 
And so I've, I've, we have, we've created a collection for that. We've also created a collection for Turtle. Does that answer? Oh, yeah, perfect. So yeah, I mean, we spoke a lot about research, but also just to get folks thinking also about their teaching and how yes, and these teaching. spaces can apply to teaching materials. The other yes. one I just have <laughs> is around yeah. altmetrics. So does altmetrics speak to Figshare? Um, Nicola, I'm going to have to investigate that a little bit more. I, th I th actually think it does. I seem to remember seeing um, on, on the University of California Figshare page that I saw altmetrics. And so I think that would be something that I could explore and see if we could get, get either Altmetrics or um, Plum Analytics onto our platform. I've got a feeling it goes through the Altmetrics Explorer, which we don't subscribe to. Um, it's it's, it's $500 um, annually. So I would have to motivate for something like that, but I think it's definitely something I can explore and it's worthwhile. Okay, wonderful. Because um, with our Oppenheimer Memorial Trust uh, funding, we have um, getting equipment to assist folks with creating online materials and encouraging um, that people share their materials via open access. And we've actually been asked um, to report on the impact of these open materials. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if Altmetric might be a route for us. Um, so yeah. yeah. Fixture has, these, has this data for you. Um, so definitely you can collect that data from Fixture. And I know that you've deposited uh, or uploaded um, items into our Fixture, but I'll do, I'll, I will explore uh, the old metrics and I will, I will uh, share that with you all. Great, thanks Debbie. Uh, any more questions folks? Please feel free to take the mic or type your question in the text chat. Can I go ahead then? And yeah, go for it, no? I want to follow up on your first question, Nicola. And Suzanne, I'm not sure if this is for you or Debbie or, or both of you. But what has happened more recently within the business school, we are now running short courses online as well. And my concern there is, is actually around copyright or intellectual property protection. So what do we do in that kind of case? Um, so for example, if we're setting up something that runs asynchronously, we might have, as Nicola described earlier, a PowerPoint presentation with voice notes built in that you convert into a video that's, that's uploaded there for what is intended just for that particular uh, class, but or the particular class or the participants enrolled for that course. But of course, anyone could just simply download that and distribute it because it's in digital format. So what kind of protections should we put in place? And, and Nicola, maybe there's even some implication for you here. Is it possible to embed material into Are You Connected so it is not downloadable? So I think it might cover all three of you. I don't know if that question makes sense. Total sense, no. Um, so actually what we've been seeing is that Are You Connected was envisioned as being very open. And even if you didn't, uh, people who didn't have an enrollment key on their courses, you know, anyone on RU Connected could go into your course site if it was open, even if they're registered for another program, and look at your materials and even download if they wanted to. Um, unfortunately, I mean, you don't want to restrict downloads, but um, we are working on ways that students only see, they can only see materials and course sites for which they are enrolled on. Uh, which is the case for most other uh, universities. And I think this is where Suzanne, Suzanne and, and us actually where we met, because um, this is one of our concerns as we observed um, a group of students uh, who were professionals working at other universities and they were going on other people's course sites and downloading materials. Um, so we thought, well, you know, how are we going to protect the lecturers um, from this? So maybe Suzanne, do you also want to say something? Thanks, Nicola. Yeah, and that is, that's exactly how I guess this talk came about, really, because uh, Nikki and myself um, had started having this conversation. Um, no, I think in the short term, definitely make sure that you place your um, 
your copyright and obviously that little reference that I uh, put on that slide um, on each of your slides and definitely all your notes. Um, if if it's going to be outside of are you connected for any reason so if you have a YouTube channel um, I know that you can password protect um, so th that only people with a certain password can access certain videos uh, and I, I don't know uh, Nikki would be the one to ask um, whether there are opportunities like that on, on several different other platforms um, I know I, I had the privilege of, of doing German one uh, and they were very, um, actually the whole lockdown wasn't as hard on, on the German um, department as it was on many others because they were doing a lot of online teaching before and I know that I had to log in with my student number and, which is very hard for a staff member to remember. Um, <laughs> but there are, there are ways and means. Um, I think one of them is to, in a sense, restrict your logins. Um, another is to, um, you know, there's unfortunately in an era of piracy and, and a, a kind of um, um, uncaring attitude to, towards plagiarism, uh, you can't be 100% protected from, from copyright infringement. But I think it depends on how you structure your course material, who you allow to be there and make it very loud and proud that it is in fact your course material. Put your, put your copyright signs all over the place. Um, this is something that, that Nikki and I have uh, conceptualized working on in the futures. What, what we'd love to happen is every student as they log in onto Are You Connected, that there's something a little bit um, interactive that they'd have to answer a question or two that would indicate that they understand copyright and plagiarism and that they understand what they are agreeing to when they when they agree not to plagiarize so so hopefully that's in the pipeline soon um, but i would just say you know find find the best ways you can to protect yourself um, and Noel, if you want to have an offline conversation about ways to go about that then i'm always available yeah, and the other option, the other option is not is you know if you want to use a Creative Commons license, it can be also some form of restriction in that people using those materials need to attribute you. So Debbie showed the different licenses. Uh, personally, I like you know attribution, so it means people have to uh, reference me. Um, I'm happy for people to reuse stuff, but just not for things to be you know, for commercial gain. So, for example, a publisher um, using it because it's been, uh, you know, made, you know, that the, that the license is that open that a publisher could pick up on it and reuse it and make money from it. So I guess that is a, it comes down to your personal decisions. Um, Debbie, what do you think? How should we be licensing our teaching materials? Or is it up to the individual lecturer uh, um, I while you've been talking I, I was thinking you've nailed everything in a nutshell um, because it is definitely up to the preferences of the um, individual and Creative Commons you can get a really strict Creative Commons and if it's if you have that um, at that icon on your tutorial or your video or, or, or anyway um, then the, the, they are liable if they break copyright and share it illegally. Thank you. Yeah, and especially for folks like yourself, like yourself, um, you know, you're doing a short course and obviously people are paying money for it. Um, and while some, you know, there may be benefits in sharing some parts openly, um, you don't want to you know, have another business school pick up on, you know, and reusing your material and it's a course that they're getting income from. Um, so yeah, it is murky territory. Any more questions, folks? Going once, going twice. Okay, so it doesn't seem like we have any more questions. Uh, so I want to say a huge thank you to Suzanne and to Debbie for presenting for us today. Um, I think it really 
gets us thinking about how we can share our work and the different ramifications, what we should be thinking about. So, yeah, thank you guys. It was awesome. Thanks so much for the opportunity and thanks everybody for their time. Yes, thank you very much for, for as, as Suzanne said, opportunity and um, yeah, it was, it was great. And talking about sharing our work <laughs> beyond the university, do you mind if I share it on our YouTube channel, this recording? Not at no, all. Not Please at go all. ahead. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.